Okay, let's see. So thanks for the introduction. So today I'll talk about the graph tiling problem, which is related to subdivisions. So embedding a large sparse graph into substantially dense graph is one of the central topic in extreme graph theory, and especially finding a minimum degree condition for ensure the existence of such embedding is. Uh, called the Dirac type condition, and it was extensively studied in various literature. So, uh, the purpose of this talk is finding a Dirac type condition for the existence of perfect subdivision tilings. So, to understand what is a perfect subdivision tilings, I will uh, start with the definition. <laughs> definition with the graph tiling. So, for a given graph H, uh, we will say H tiling is a collection of vertex disjoint copies of H. And we say this tiling is a perfect if the host graph G contains a H tiling that covers every vertex of G. Maybe the most familiar <coughs> example for perfect graph tiling is uh, perfect matchings. We can consider a perfect matching is a <coughs> perfect K2 tiling. And it is natural to define the minimum degree threshold for existence of uh, perfect graph tiling, I will denote it as a delta nh, uh, which is a smallest initial k that every n vertex graph G with minimum degree at least k <coughs> has a perfect edge tiling. So when you say you have copy of h, do you mean uh, induced subgraph? No, no, or it's or a subgraph. subgraph, just for a subgraph. Everything in here is a subgraph, and every graph h in, in here has a at least one edge. So, which is not a disjoint union of isolated vertices. And a uh, well known theorem of Dirac states that every even number of even uh, number of vertices graph G with minimum degree and least half of its order has a uh, contains a perfect matching. And one of the very famous <coughs> generalization of Dirac's theorem is the Heiner Simon's theorem. Which is generalized Dirac theorem to uh, clip. Oh, actually, this is not an equality, it's exactly the same. It's an uh, equality. So, uh, if R divides N, then, then the minimum degree threshold for perfect tiling for KR is exactly 1 minus 1 over R times N. And then Alun used to further generalize the Heiner Simon's theorem into uh, gener general graph H. So, if the order of H divides N, then Minimum degree threshold is roughly bounded by roughly one minus one over chromatic number of h times n. And after Alun and Euster, Kolmos, Sarkozy, and Stemmerady improved the Alun and Euster's theorem to replace retro one times term in their results to some uh, additive constant, which is depending only on the graph h. So, uh, so far we are. Uh, considering about the perfect graph tiling, then what about the what about the almost perfect tilings? So almost perfect tiling is uh, not a perfect tiling, but it is it covers almost all vertices. So in two thousand, Komlos proved that every graph G with minimum degree at least one minus one over chi C R H times n contains a uh, almost uh, H tiling. Here the chi C R H is the Critical chromatic number of which I will not I will not explain why this is the critical chromatic number of which, but just keep in mind that this number is nice between the chromatic number of which minus one and chromatic number of which. What is critical chromatic number? Oh. I, I just say that I will not <laughs> explain it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have enough time, so you can yeah. go slowly. Yeah. So we. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so the critical chromatic number of H is uh, H minus one, two, four. Here the chi is a chromatic number of H and sigma H is a size of the smallest color class in the optimal coloring of H. So this lies between this number and when H is a click, H is a click, then this critical chromatic number is same as just same as the 
chromatic number of, of h. Wait, so you say uh, so this sigma is the smallest size, but what I mean I maybe it uh, depending on the color. Size of smallest uh, color classes in yes, some yes, coloring or in every when we use exactly only chi h number of colors. So uh, this is the uh, h and we have an independent set with the chi h parts. Is it the minimum and sigma is the yeah, minimum, possible minimum size of this. It's the minimum number of vertices you have to delete. Yes, yes, so yes. The minimum chromatic number comes down. Ah, OK. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see. So minimum size, yeah, yes. minimum size of smallest color class, I see. Yeah. OK. Uh -huh. okay. okay, and then later, Shopopan and Zhao should Zhao improve the Colmosis result. Uh, just missing a most finite number of vertices. So this critical chromatic number is the central is the central parameter when we are concerned about the almost perfect timings. So uh, so far we are concerned about the perfect tiling, and for the perfect tiling, the upper bounds are all, all the known upper bounds are related to chromatic number of uh, given graph H, and the almost Perfect tiling, almost perfect tiling. The threshold is related to the critical chromatic number of H. Then, what would be what will be the asymptotically tight values for delta and H? Is it maybe we can speculate that this number is related to one of the chromatic number or critical chromatic number? And we can then what will, what is the what <coughs> what will be the uh, suitable parameter for delta and H? And this problem was uh, completely solved by Kuhn and Ostus. So they showed that the threshold is uh, exactly 1 minus 1 over chi star h times n plus the um, additive constant. And this chi star h is either a chromatic number of h or a critical chromatic number of h. Uh, actually, in their original paper, Kuhn and Ostus uh, explicitly uh, Classify when what is the value of chi star h for every graph h, but uh, I will skip it in this talk because it's too complex. Your theorem, so you 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 didn't say asymptotically something, right? This, so something. Do you mean that n is uh, do you assume that n is large? Yeah, or? assume that n is supplementary large. And without any parity condition or divisibility condition. Ah, ah also, also, <laughs> we always have a parity condition, a divisibility condition. So this equality always hold is is only hold when n is divisible by the order of h. Uh huh. Actually, what was ch? Just the uh, additive constant depending only on the graph h. Okay. Okay. And now uh, let's talk about the uh, subregional tiling, which is our interest. So uh, subregional tiling is basically a generalization of graph tiling. Uh, the definition is the subregional tiling is a collection of vertex disjoint copies of subdivisions of H, and we say this tiling is a perfect if the host graph G contains a H subregional tiling that covers all vertices of G. <laughs> <laughs> And there is a quite interesting result by Kuhn and Ostus. They uh, they show that for every positive constant c, uh, and n is and if n is sufficiently large, then every c n regular graph G on n vertices contains a perfect k four and perfect k five subdivision tilings. And for the larger values k six, k seven, and so on, they uh, it was remains uh, open conjecture. What about K three? K three is just uh, a cycle, so it is uh, for a regular graph. Uh. Oh, I I forgot it, but it, uh, I think it was proved. Yes, yeah, it was yeah. proved by Bolstarte. I I forgot the name. <laughs> Maybe you can turn off the Wi-Fi. Yeah, please. Come. <laughs> Then the next next natural question is: Can we get can we define the 
minimum degree threshold for HWL tiling. So I define this notation delta uh, sub sub nh. This is a smallest integer k such that every involuntary script with minimum degree at least k has a perfect subdivision tiling. Uh, and I think this uh, subdivision tiling has a very interesting property. So one of our, one of the corollaries of our main result is this. So this threshold for small clicks behaves unpredictably when r is small. So the first n over 3 is for threshold for k2, and second is for k3, and third is for k4, and so on. And as you can see, that for the value of the first part is looks quite unpredictable. So uh, I think this is uh, quite interesting. And the second remark is. Uh, so what do, what do you mean by or? Uh, ah, yeah. this is a very interesting. That part is uh, for K7. And for the K7, it depends on the Pareto band. The okay. threshold depends on the Pareto band. Uh, yeah, that is very interesting part. It depends on what? Depend on the parity of n. Yeah. And then all, all of these things are asymptotically. <laughs> not, not exactly. <laughs> and also, one another remark is this subdivision tiling has no monotonicity. Uh, what I, it means that when you're considering uh, just a perfect graph tiling, let's consider <coughs> two graphs, h1 and h2. And also, h1 is a spanning, spanning subgraph of h2. Then obviously the threshold for H1 is should be smaller or equal to H2 since it is a span subdivision of H2. However, the in the subdivision tiling, this property does not hold anymore. So for example, the cycle of length for C4 is a uh, spanning subgraph of K4, but uh, its minimum degree threshold for Subdivision tiling of C4 is strictly asymptotically and strictly larger than threshold for the click of order 4. So I think this is one of the interesting uh, properties. Now uh, I will show my main result. So this is not, uh, not exactly formulated, but just see the <laughs> statement. So. I proved that for every graph H, there exists a parameter psi star such that the threshold is asymptotically uh, 1 minus 1 over psi star H times n, except for one case. This exceptional case is the K7 and some other things. So in this exceptional case, it depends on the parity of n. So basically, I want to fit my statement to the this, uh, I don't know. This type of theorem, this Kuhn and type theorem, so you can see some similar. Okay, so, except case is only case 7, right? No, no, no. Okay. exceptional case is dep depends on some another property, another parameter. So, is it finite this or? No, it is uh, infinitely many cases. Okay. And to prove our main theorem, we have to overcome two obstacles, and the first one I call a space barrier. So uh, let's consider this situation. Uh, if our first graph G is a complete bipartite graph, we have uh, some unbalanced list in here. And now consider the every bipartite subdivision of H. And when we observe the every bipartite subdivision of H, if it looks in some sense is a balanced, balanced, then we cannot embed the uh, subdivisions perfectly in G because we consider this ratio between these two uh, bipartisan sides. So since the our host graph is a bipartite graph, so if there exists a Perfect subdivision, perfect subdivision tiling of H, then each component should be a bipartite subdivision of H. However, the host graph has a very unbalanced, but the every bipartite, bipartite subdivision of H is in some sense balanced, so we cannot embed this thing into this one. So this poses some space barrier, 
So we to overcome this problem, overcome this problem, we need to uh, measure how the bipartite subdivision of H can be unbalanced. So we define f h x is as a function like this. It looks a bit complex, but uh, it is just like this. So let's consider x and y is a uh, to part to vertex partition of V H, and if there if there might be some edges between the X and Y in H, then just let it here. And now consider two consider an edge uh, contained in X. Then for this edge, we introduce a new vertex in the Y part, and erase this edge, and join these two original edges. And we do for all edge in here. And we do all edges in Y as the same thing, like here. Then, then this is a bipartite subdivision, one of the bipartite subdivision of H, and the size of this part, part is a size of X plus edge of Y, edge inside in, in Y, and this part is size of Y plus edges inside in x part. So this function x is basically the measures the ratio between this one and the entire one. So in some sense you can consider this fx measures how the bipartite subdivision can be unbalanced. Okay. And now we define this psi h is the minimum value for this function. And uh, you can observe that this parameter is lies between one and two, and we note that since this uh, f h x is defined as the whole size over the this small size, so if the psi h is uh, close to two, it means the bipartite subdivision of h is in some sense balanced. So it is hard to embed, and if this psi h is uh, close to two one, it means the bipartite subdivision of H is close to is uh, in some sense highly unbalanced, so it is easy to embed. So this psi H is uh, represent the space barrier for H. So this parameter is important to define our parameter psi star H. Okay, and next is the divisibility barrier. So in now let's consider. Uh, like this. So let consider again. We consider every uh, possible bipartite subdivisions of H. We uh, let assume that the size difference between these two parties is divisible by three, and again the size difference between these two parties is divisible by three, and so on. And now we consider a graph G is uh, almost complete, and this size, this part is uh, n over two plus one, and the size of this part is n over two minus one. Then the difference between the these two bipartition is two. Then in this graph, we cannot imagine a perfect subdivision H subdivision entirely, because since again since the host graph is a bipartite graph. So if there exists a perfect H subdivision tiling, then each component should be a bipartite. But for every bipartite, uh, bipartite subdivision of H, their difference between their bipartite bipartisan sets is divisible by three. So in here, the if there exists a perfect subdivision tiling, then the difference between this part and this part should be divisible by three. But Two cannot be divisible by C, so this poses uh, divisibility barrier. So uh, here, this H shape psi H is the highest factor for C H, and C H is nothing but a uh, collection of the differences between these parts. So this uh, represents the divisibility barrier, and if the in and if every bipartisan size bipartite subdivisions for every bipartite subdivision of H, if we if the every two parts are the same, then 
we define this h shape psi h as a infinity. Uh, common vector? What, what do you mean? Uh, hi, uh, <coughs> the greatest, greatest common vector and highest mm. common vector. In. You mean GCD or? Ah, yes, GCD. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Now we are ready to define our parameter, Kusai star h. Uh, if h set Kusai h is 1, it, it, it means uh, the divisibility variable doesn't affect, so we just said this is the same as psi uh, h. And if h set psi h is 2, then we set this value as a uh, maximum between 3 over 2 and psi h, and otherwise just set 2. Okay, uh, you can, you bet there is some weird between this maximum of three of maximum of three over two and psi h, but this is a uh, natural number to appear. I will explain it later. Okay. Then now uh, we can state our main theorem exactly. So uh, this is my first main theorem. So if h is psi h is not equal to two, then asymptotically the threshold for subdivision tiling is. Or minus one over psi star h times n, and if h sub psi h is two, then it depends on the parity of n. So when n is odd, then the threshold is roughly n over two, and when n is even, then threshold is roughly one minus one over psi star h times n. Uh, since when h sub psi h is two, we define h. Uh, psi star h is a maximum between 0 over 2 and uh, this psi h so this this is uh, also 1 over the one, n over 3 or 1 minus 1 over psi h times n so, uh, and all of our corolla is just for the threshold for uh, clicks and as you can and for when r is less than or equal to 5, then h set psi kr is exactly 1. And when r is 7, then h set psi is 2. So since it is 2, uh, we have to uh, see the parity over the n. And when r is 6 and r is at least 8, then the h set psi kr is at least 3. So we have this corollary. And I want to focus on this second thing when r is between 3 and 5. As you can see that the this threshold goes to go, is decreasing as r goes to as r increasing. Um, <coughs> the, I think this go interest go against to our intuition because uh, in many cases embedding a more complex structure is harder than embedding a simple structure. However, for the purpose of the tiling, it converts, it, the situation was converted. So I think this is very interesting case. So, okay, now let's talk about the uh, extremal cases. So now let's consult the lower bound cases first. So uh, basically, I already uh, dis described because for the lower bound, for the lower bounds, uh, the construction is depend on the definition of space barrier and divisibility barrier. When uh, h shape psi h is one, then space barrier mainly affect, and the, this value is uh, greater than two, then divisibility barrier affect. And when maybe the most interesting case is h shape psi h is two, then space and divisibility barrier affect, and it depends on the parity of n. So in more detail, so by our definition of the psi h, we generally have that delta sub and h is at least one minus one over psi h times n minus one by this type of space barrier. So basically, we con we for the lower bound we take this unbalanced graph with this part is locally one over psi h n, and this is one over psi 
and though this is psi h minus one times n times n. Uh, or uh, uh, you can compute that this uh, psi h uh, actually uh, well behaves as this uh, for this lower bound. So this is the general lower bound case for which appears from the space barrier. And now let's consider the divisibility barrier. Let's first that consider that when h cf psi h is l three. Then it is very simple. Then consider the almost balanced bicontact graph in here. If n is uh, even, and take this part is n over two plus one, and this part is n over two minus one, and is even. And when n is odd, take this part is a uh, ceiling of n over two, and this part is a floor of n over two. Then the difference between these two bipartition is one or two, which cannot be divisible by HCF psi H. So in both two cases, this graph cannot contain the uh, perfect subjective tiling of H, and the minimum degree is roughly n over two. So this is the divis when HCF psi H is at least more like, greater than two. And now consider when HCF psi H is two. When uh, n is when n is odd, then difference between these two sides is just a one. So again, uh, the this divisibility barrier uh, behaves for this one. So in this case, the the this graph cannot contains the perfect subdivision tiling of H. But the problem, so in this case, we have the lower bound roughly n over two in here. But the problem is when n is even. Okay, when n is even, the difference is between here is a uh, two, but two can divisible by two. So this is this cannot no longer provide a lower bound. So we have to consider another lower bound. So for this case, another lower bound is looks like this. This is a uh, three and this joint. And this is locally n over three. This is the locally n over three plus one. This is locally n over three minus one. And this is a complete bicontact graph. Then this different between different between the size of this bipartition is one, which cannot be divisible by two. So in this, so just for this component, there cannot be exist a perfect edge subdivision tiling. But since these are <coughs> this joint, this means that the whole graph cannot contain a perfect edge of the tilings. And the minimum degree is locally n over 3. Okay, so minimum degree is locally n over 3. So this is why we have this type of the formula uh, 3 over 2 and psi h for, for cover this case. This 3 over 2 is for this case. So these are for the lower bound. And now consider the general general upper bound. So for every graph H, we generally have that delta sub N H is bounded by locally N over two. This is very uh, easy. Let H one is just a fixed bipartite subdivision of H, and let H two is obtained from H one by increasing. Uh, one edge of H1 to uh, make a longer pass by adding a one vertex one by one until we ensure that VH1 divides N minus VH2. Then uh, since H2 is just obtained by a replace one edge from a bipartite graph, so its chromatic no number is N minus three. So by Elliston Simonovich theorem, there for in the our host graph G contains the uh, H two, and then the other part we can tile the uncovered vertices with the H one by using the Kuhn-Edwards Dorsus tiling theorem. Okay, so we have this general upper bound. 
Now, then combining the lower bound cases and the general upper bound, we to prove our two main theorems, it suffice to proving these two lemmas. So, when H shape psi is uh, in one, then the it when and if the minimum degree is roughly this, then G has a perfect sublimal tiling. And when uh, H shape psi is two, then two this to show that this is actually the exact minimum degree threshold. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's go how to prove this. So to in order to prove our the previous two lemmas, we use the absorbing method. <coughs> so uh, we consider. Uh, we will construct a suitable absorbers for our setting. So, mm -hmm. what we want to do is finding uh, many vertex disjoint copies of sub resistance. So, it is natural to consider this type of absorber. So, let x is a vertex set, and let mm -hmm. y, uh, let a is a vertex disjoint set, which is disjoint from x. Then uh, we now consider that if A has a perfect subdivision tiling, and also all together X union A also has a perfect subdivision tiling with the uh, H, then we say that A is a sub H observable for this vertex at X. Because uh, we will pre embed this absorber A in many many copies. Then we can find in each each part in A we have a perfect subdivision H. And if there is some uncovered vertex here, then we can simply break these pre embedded uh, copies of subdivisions of H. But then and then absorbing these vertices X to using the definition of sub H absorbers. So that was the definition. And to construct this type of uh, sub uh, absorber, uh, we have this three type of sub H absorber and one special uh, unit which is called exchanger. Basically, it is not an absorber, but it is it plays an important role. So uh, let's talk about what is a type of sub H absorber. Uh, it is a weak, but it can easily found it so this type of sub H absorber is the most important uh, sub H absorber so now consider a bipartite subdivision one bipartite subdivision of H and now consider just a fix of one H in here and then we and then we and then we Subdivide this edge two times here. Then still, this is a sub bipartite subdivision of edge, and let this x let let this x and y is come from other side, and we want to build a sub edge absorber for these two vertex. Then uh, we just adding these two edges in here. Then uh, for this part. Itself is a subdivision of H, and also together with X and Y, the whole things are also a subdivision of H. Because to proving that this whole part is a subdivision of H is just like this. To uh, go to this vertex, to this vertex, we are not choosing this path, but we choose this, 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 this. Then it is a by this, then it is a subdivision of H. So, so we can say that the vertex set in here is a sub H absorber for vertex set X and Y. And this is a type of sub H absorber and a sub H absorber. But however, by when we using a type of sub H absorber, we cannot absorb single vertex one by one. We have we must have to 
uh, absorb a pair of vertices simultaneously. So it is uh, in some sense weak. However, this is a bipartite graph, so we can easily found by some supersaturation and some other things. So it's weak, but uh, it can be easily found. And next is a type two and type three sub H absorber. So again, uh, consider a bipartite subdivision of H and just fix uh, one edge between these two bipartite bi partition. And let's say that this we want to absorb this vertex edge, then simply add like this. And obviously, this has a this is a subdivision of X, subdivision of H, and all together is also a subdivision of H because when we uh, go here to here, we do not choose this edge but choose the yellow one, then it is a subdivision. So this is a type 2 subdivision, and as you can see, this type 2 subdivision can absorb a single vertex one by one, so it is very strong, but it contains a triangle. But in many cases, uh, we have to deal when our host graph is a bipartite, so it does not contain a triangle. So type 2 sub HHO is very strong, but it does not always exist. Mm -hmm. And also type 3 sub HHO is very similar to type 2. The difference is type 3 uses a pentagon, not a triangle, mm -hmm. and it is uh, a bit it has a bit complex structure, but so I will skip it. And as I said, that type two and type three sub H two is very strong, but it does not always exist. So I will introduce the sub H exchanger, which can uh, exchange the unobservable vertex to observable vertex. So what I mean is, uh, okay, let's see this one. So now consider. Uh, uh, graph. Let every vertex of graph G graph every vertex of H is, is just inside in this part. And if there is an H, then we erase this H and put one new vertex here and go like here. Just uh, one subdivision of uh, of the our graph H, then. It maybe looks like this one, like this, and so on. So, um, and basically, this is just a one specific type of subdivision of H. With this part has a degree or all degree two. Uh, we can we can find this subdivision, and the sub -A, we say that this structure is sub H exchanger for U and V. Let's say this is a here is a U, and here is a V. Uh, just removing <coughs> this part and add this and this. Then, uh, by our construction, uh, if we forgot this U, then this whole thing are subdivision of H, and if we forgot this V, then this whole thing are subdivision for for H, like right here. So this is a sub H exchanger, and why I introduce is let's consider uh, this U. There exists uh, many copy of a type two sub H absorber to absorbing U. However, let's assume that V does not having any this suitable type two sub H absorber. Then how can we handle this vortex V? <coughs> the solution is if we have uh, this sub H, sub H absorber. Then we, as sub edge exchanger, we choose this one. Then we then this produce uh, vertex U. But vertex U has a type two type two sub edge absorber. So we just choosing this one. Then we can, in some sense, absorb this vertex V. So this is the idea. Okay. So these are the basic absorber units. So now we have to. Uh, can have to find the many copies of this uh, units to construct the suitable efficient absorbers. So, uh, what we want is we want to find many vertex disjoint sub edge absorber units. Uh, 
Uh, we can we can do this by the super saturation and do some probabilistic method. And also we can ensure that each vertex of each vertex or a pair of vertices here the pair of vertices for type one actual pair of vertices in a specific structure has many sub edge actuals. And then uh, we can greedily absorb the vertices. So uh, there are a lot of things uh, omitted, but anyway, we can get the suitable survey change Okay. Uh, now uh, let's go into the proof. Uh, in this talk, I will talk about the uh, first part because this one is much easier than the later part. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what I want to do is we, so in, in this, so uh, from this I will assume that for every vertex, every graph H has the HCF psi H is 1, then it suffices to show that if this minimum degree threshold is, uh, <coughs> forces the existence of perfect external timings. Okay, now let's go into the proof sketch. So the first step is press the sub-edge absorbers. Uh, we will apply the regularity lemma to and apply the regularity lemma and produce a reduced graph with uh, appropriately chosen parameters. Once we uh, choose uh, suitable parameters, then we can get a reduced graph which inherits the minimum degree condition it's uh, almost the same as the host graph so we will do this so then let these no, okay. let us assume these are vertices which is a cluster of vertices of host graph and let these is these are the our reduced graph and it has a large minimum degree in, in here in the reduced graph R. And then uh, we the next step is we will collect a small domain set. To here uh, I will use some uh, this old old lemma by R. Dautov and Kayan, which means that uh, if the graph is sufficiently dense, then we can get a sufficiently small uh, dominating set. Since this minimum degree delta in our case is linear, so actually we can get a logarithmic small dominating set. So let's assume these three are dominating set for this reduced graph. Then since uh, our graph is mm -hmm. dense, then we will find the one side matching for here. So these are matching matchings. And we will find this uh, matching in here. Uh, and then uh, since these are dominating set, all the other vertices looks like we can parti partition the vertex set to looks like this like this okay and these are the batchings that we first choose and we will make a one side superlegal pairs between these edges so what I mean is so basically the Super regular pair is a uh, epsilon regular pair equipped with a minimum degree condition, and one side super regular pair is a place between them. So it is a epsilon epsilon regular pair, but it has a minimum minimum degree condition only in the one side in here. So what I want to do is, so let's focus on this. We can remove a small number of vertices in here to make sure that this vertex has a many neighborhood in here. Okay. And for this yellow edges, we will make we will delete some small number of vertices to make just the ordinary super regular pair in here. So they are super regular pair. Then for every vertex in here, by the definition of a super regular pair, there is a large neighborhood in this part. Then now consider the edges between these two neighborhoods. 
then by the if epsilon regular then by the definition of a reduced graph, they are subject to death. And and we in the type one sub H F Jobor is a bipartite graph. So by the supertextualization, we can get many copies of type one sub H F Jobor for these two vertices in here. Okay. So this is how we how we get the sub H F Jobor basically this basically. Okay. So by this process we can get the sub H F Jobor. Now we have to control the parities. Since we are using a type of sub H F Jobor, we have we have to fit the parity because sub H F Jobor always absorb two vertices simultaneously so sometimes uh, it has a problem of concerning about the parities so we need to control the parities and to this part the divisibility barrier h the definition of h shape psi h plus a central rule so uh, we have that this h shape <coughs> psi h is a uh, one and the by the definition of h shape psi h uh, there exists a bipartite graph H hat, which has a vertex that its size difference is one. Let's say this part has a H vertices, and this part is H plus one vertices, and this is a bipartite graph, and H has a perfect H subject entirely. This can be done by the definition of H psi H. So uh, once we have this structure, we now consider we have many copy of this H hat like this, like this. So these are all H hat with the two bipartisan size. We will embed this between this part. So we have the first H head and the second H head, and so we will embed this suitably many times at here. Uh, it can be done by the definition of the reduced graph and Lipschitz regular pairs. Uh, if if we uh, if we have to fit the parity, then we will break this. Pre embedded edge head one by one to fit the parity between two bipartite bipartisan sizes. So uh, now we uh, have to cover almost all vertices and then we will absorb them. So uh, in here, we uh, the space barrier uh, <coughs> appears again. So uh, let me remind you the definition of this psi h, which measures the how the bipartite subdivisions can be unbalanced. Then by the definition of it, uh, psi h, uh, there exists a special graph h star, which is uh, just this. So, uh, so uh, you can just consider that this h star is the most unbalanced bipartite subdivisions of H. You can intuitively <coughs> just think like that. So just keep in mind that this H star is the most unbalanced bipartite subdivisions of H. Then a uh, simple observation is 1 minus 1 over psi H is at least greater than or equal to 1 minus 1 over critical chromatic number of H star. Okay, uh, you, we can simply show this observation. Then we can apply this Schopenhauer and Jaus result. So this means that if the minimum degree is greater than or equal to one minus one over critical chromatic number of h times n, contains uh, almost all the h h tiling that are just missing a finite number of vertices. And since this observation. Uh, and also combined with Sokopande and Zhao, we can cover almost all remains vertices by H star. So we the left thing is just absorbing the uncovered vertices. 
Uh, then uh, now we have to use this pre embedded edge head. So now consider that for each this component, each this part, let focus on this one. So let this is a slight focus This is a in this part, let uh, there are three uncovered vertices <coughs> in this part, and total in, in here, there are total five uncovered vertices in this part, let us assume. Then what we want to do is absorbing these vertices by using a time on sub edge absorber. However, the time to using a time on sub edge absorber, we, if we want to use these two pairs, and this pair, and this pair, then we cannot absorb this two pair. Okay, so we have to uh, make sure that the number of uncovered vertices between the left part and right part should be equal. Then, uh, how to prove this? How to solve this problem? The answer is just breaking this pre-embedded edge. Head. So, in actually, in this, uh, the edge head is pre-embedded like this. Then if we break this one, then it produces, let's say, this has a two vertices in here, and it has a three vertices in here. And once we break this H8, it produces three vertices in here, and two vertices in here. And again break the same, the same type H hat, then it gives us three uncovered vertices and two uncovered vertices. Then the size of the left and right uncovered vertices is the same. And then we can use the type 1 sub edge etc. So by this, uh, we can we can prove our main theory. Okay. Okay, so uh, now I will talk about the concluding remark. So uh, I remains this is a conjecture. It is nothing but just uh, replace. Can we replace the our error term bit row into just a finite, just a additive constant, which is depending only on h. So basically, our result has a error term. Uh, yeah, this error term bit row one term, and my conjecture is we can actually remove that to uh, just a what the constant. So there is the one uh, <laughs> <laughs> one conjecture. And the second one is let consider this curly F be a collection of graphs and let H C F uh, this curly F be the highest common factor of the sizes of graphs in that. Then for the constant for each positive integer n divisible by this h shape f call f, then we can define this delta and and comma call f to be the minimum degree threshold for uh, perfect styling, which uses the uh, graphs only in f. So in this notation, I. Uh, prove the asymptotically tight value for delta and comma subdivisions of h. So this is my problem. Can we determine the number delta and f for some good families? So this is my one of my open problem and that's it. Okay, well, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think according to your proof, you use linearly many copies of subdivision of H oh. to cover everything. Yes. But I think that if the threshold is one half, then using bandwidth theorem, we can cover by a single subdivision. Then, mm, yeah, yeah. then my question is that then can we do it with some, say, roughly square root, to n, square root of n copies of H, something like that? Did you think uh, about this kind of problem, or uh, do you uh, you want to consider the number of copies of the tilings? Yes, right. Uh, actually, 
for the just the ordinary edge tiling problem, this direction is uh, recently uh, studied by use and Tagalog and some other things. They proving that uh, for the graph tiling problem, uh, they can show that when the size of H is a uh, roughly square root 10, then we can then the Kuhn-Ost two type theorem is still hold. They, I I maybe this is not accurate, but this type of uh, problem they are working in here. But I'm not sure we can do that in this setting because we. We, because for covering almost the overall vertices, we highly relied on the Sokopanda and Zhao's result, and that was uh, that was just constant when H is a fixed graph. The size of H is just a constant, so I'm not sure we can do this. Thank you. Thank you. If we Tiling rather than the subdivision, if we tiling minor model, then is there any feature? Ah, that was the problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I okay. didn't focus much. So. Uh -huh. so, so basically, this problem is can you do the similar thing for other families of graphs? Uh -huh. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I have, I'm curious about this parameter that you define is yes. uh, from the space barrier. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, when you subdivide an edge, is it obvious that this parameter doesn't change? Like, I mean, the co my question is. At uh, uh, this, this one, you mean? Yeah. So, the thing is, if I start with the h, and then I sub, then let's say h prime is the subdivision of h. Yes. Uh, or, or maybe, oh yeah, maybe I'm. Asking silly question, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my <laughs> question is that if you can tile by h prime, then you can, then you also tile by h, right? Because h prime is a subdivision of h. Okay. So tiling by h prime already implies that you have a perfect tiling by h. So I'm curious whether these parameters, these coefficients, never behave in a weird way. So uh, actually. Uh, so for answer the question is this this does not change because this psi h is uh, defined like a, just a minimum value of this function and this function has a just the domain of this function is just a finite number of cases so yeah. it does not change and I I can I cannot understand your uh, uh, so the, what I what I mean is that if I subdivide the vertex and okay. if I subdivide an edge to okay. create one more vertex, okay, right? then whether this function is same or different. Ah 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 ah, ah I see. Hmm. Mm. I think we uh, it, it should be <laughs> yeah different because just constant uh, k two and this psi is uh just uh, this is the most unbalanced one. Okay. Uh -huh. But just consider this pass. So this pass is obviously a subdivision of this K2. But the most unbalanced subdivision of this pass is looks like this one. So it so this side should be changed. I see. So it's kind of monotone. I'm, I'm not sure this is monotone, but yeah, okay. anyway. <laughs> I, I mean, if your theorem is true, then it has to be. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just All right. um, And can you give also some bound on the num uh, number of times you subdivide the edge? Like yes, actually, we can bound the number of the subdivision. So, actually, we can, by our proof in plus, we can use only finite kind of subdivi subdivisions. Mm -hmm. So, but. Uh, I don't think that was quite interesting to mention it. So, so do you like have a constant number like yes, yes, ten yeah. or yeah, just just like that. So every edge is subdivided at most ten or most hundred. Or it should be more than ten, but uh, maybe just a finite number. I did compute that. I see. Um, 
I saw, I remember seeing in, in the history, where, where you went over the background, you mentioned some results about tiling just with the graph H. Okay. But uh, were, were there pre previous work with tiling subdivisions? I think I, I, I don't know if I saw that. Uh, uh, no, you mean the Kuhn and Ostus subdivision tiling? Uh, there's any work on ah, tiling by subdivisions. I uh, think the, the ones you saw was H, H tilings. <laughs> Basically, I coined this term H W tiling. So I didn't know this theorem when I uploaded this archive, and and when I uploaded my paper to archive, and Kuhn, Professor Kuhn and Ostus made me. <laughs> so I so you independently <laughs> came up with this concept of subdivision tiling? Uh, actually, I, when I was working on this project, I don't know the Kuhn and Ostus tiling theorem. So uh, okay. uh, I, I don't know. I, I see. So. <coughs> okay. Is there any result uh, about hy hypergraph? I mean, ah. hypergraphs yeah, that, that is quite good question because I want to uh, consider some generalization about the hypergraph because uh, in in recent recent recently uh, there are some many papers about the uh, hypergraph tiling hypergraph tiling perfect hypergraph tiling problem. So the maybe the natural question is can we generalize this to hypergraph? But there is very cute very serious problem. How can you define the subdivision in the hypergraph? So maybe that is the obstacle. The subdivision. This might be a dumb question, but uh, when considering of H subdivision tiling, you said that the fiber type H uh, might uh, require less minimum degree. So you're yes. caring about fiber type H. Yes. But in this case, like fiber, to make H fiber type, we need lots of more vertices included to the subdivision. Yes. So, uh, uh, how is the assumption of the making H fiber type possible when uh, H subdivision to fiber type needs more vertices? So you want to know when the fiber type subdivision have too many vertices? So maybe it can. Yeah, maybe problem? it can. Yeah. I was just curious. Ah, oh, it can uh, solve by. Uh, so uh, since I am an uh, extreme optometrist, so this our end is very big, ah. very very big. So, <laughs> so <laughs> no, you, big, yeah. yeah, everything is fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah, maybe one probably silly question. So, is there a version for OS type? Yeah. Ah. The sum of the degrees of uh, ah, yeah, ah, yes, ah, yes, yeah, yes. I want to mention uh, Professor Sanger's question. So, uh, maybe the next natural question is can you find the OLED type condition for this tiny? But uh, I think <coughs> maybe it would be interesting, but I cannot success to prove it because. Uh, I don't know the proof of all this theorem, so. Yeah, but I think that is very good question, so might be, that would be my next project. It's kind of interesting that the Kunin this need such a, need any positive density, they can find already K4 and K5, but you need a much higher, a much larger, yeah, condition on the minimum degree, and this comes from the fact that it just if you have a complete bipartite graph with, uh, if it's very unbalanced, yes, then yes, maybe yes. you can't find the cape, can't tile everything. And is there a, some weak, maybe a weaker condition than forcing complete regularity that would still eliminate these, these kind of extreme examples that you have, or have you thought about? Uh, so uh, basically, the Kuhn and Ostus's theorem for subdivision tiling works. The basic reason for the Kuhn and Ostus theorem is two is they are working on the regular graph, so right. it is in some sense uh, have uh, some pseudo randomness. So basically, they are uh, use a blower lemma on the regular graph. Then, since it is a uh, regular, you can proceed the load level. I, at here, load load level method to make make sure the pseudo randomness. So I think 
maybe if we can uh, adding some uh, some weak, weaker pseudo random list condition in this here, then maybe the minimum degree threshold should be decreased. Right. Yeah, but I don't know with what would be the correct pseudo random condition for this problem. I think we grew it enough, so maybe. <laughs> 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 All right, let's thank the speaker.